Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Come on, you can do better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad to be back. You know, I was looking at my calendar when was the last time I was here and found out that this is actually my first time for this year. Yeah. So last year was the last time. So it's almost like once a year I'm here. All right. Praise God. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, those of you, especially those of you who've been uh, praying for me. You know, I try to post on, um, on uh, Facebook uh, places where I go to and uh, conduct seminars. And there are actually people who would pause and uh, really pray. And so if you're one of those, uh, thank you so much. We've been in uh, 10 countries uh, to date. And so um, September to November, I still have seven more countries to go. And so again, uh, for a 58-year-old 50, man, you know, changing time zones is not easy. My, my body is still aching right now. It's uh, seven hours advance, so I was a little sleepy, so I have to stand at the back. And so if I fall asleep, please wake me up, okay? <laughs> Praise God. So that's the Apollos Project. I'm still part of the leadership of Champion Life, but at the same time, I'm doing an uh, itinerant teaching ministry. And so I really thank God for this. But I'm excited to study God's Word with you this afternoon. And I've entitled this sermon, A Light to My Path, which talks about the ministry of God's Word and our response to it. I mean, we praise God that He did not leave us in the dark, groping as we walk along this dark and decaying world. God gave us His Word to light up our path, so we don't stumble, so that we can know the dangers ahead of us, so we can see the right direction and we can reach our destination. And one of the chapters in the Bible that talks about the Word of God is Psalm 119. Now this is the longest chapter in the whole Bible, 176 verses. If we're going to study this whole chapter, it will take us uh, several days. But for this afternoon, we're going to look at at least three verses from this chapter, 105 to 107. Let's all stand and read together these uh, three verses from the same translation right there. All together now, ready, read. Your word is a lamp to my feet. And a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Let's pray. Most gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the privilege that we have in this country to come together, to worship you in spirit and in truth, and study your word openly. Lord, we realize that we have brothers and sisters, they need to hide somewhere. Some of them don't even have the word, the Bible. And so God, Lord, we just pray right now that we will indeed leave this sanctuary with a special message from you. And so Lord, open our eyes, enlighten our minds, cover us now with your precious blood so that indeed, Lord, we will be changed after this sermon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may take your seats. Psalm 119, again, the longest chapter in the Bible. This is called an acrostic psalm. The reason it's called acrostic, there are, this whole psalm is divided into 22 sections, eight verses per section. And each section starts out with the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, so each section starts out with that Hebrew alphabet. So the first eight verses starts with Aleph, and then the next eight verses, starting in verse 9, the second Hebrew letter is Beth, and so on. And obviously this is to help them in their memorization. You know, the Jews before they memorized big chunks of the Word of God to help them in their meditation of God. God's word and very interesting in these 22 sections because there are 22 letters you find the name of God Yahweh 22 times as well and so but what predicated this whole psalm is a question the writer asked in the second section in verse 9 and so the the second section opens up with this question how can a young person stay on the path of purity the translation I memorized before is Revised Standard Version, and it says there, how can a young man keep his way pure? Now, friends, I cannot overemphasize how important this question is, especially considering the survey telling us what the world is like. 
according to the Barna Group, in North America, there are now 42 million pornographic websites. 42 million pornographic websites. And then the survey says 11 is the average age that a child is first exposed to pornography. And 94% of children here in North America will, be, will see pornography by the age of 14. And so those of you who are parents here with small kids, that's the reality now. All right? And then number three, of young Christian adults, these are young people who are attending churches, 18 to 24 years old, 76% actively search for pornography. And the most shocking one in their survey, 68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors view pornography on a reg regular basis. Wow! How did they know that they did not ask me? <laughs> well, friends, there's no doubt how important that question is. The question, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? But I tell you, that's not, it's not only for young people, it's for older people. I mean, I've heard of couples, even at the retirement age, they would still separate because of another relationship. And so friends, if you're not into surveys, just consider what the Apostle Paul warned us in his last letter before he was beheaded. He said here in 2 Timothy 3, 1, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. In a more graphic translation, 3, 1 says, I want you to know this to Timothy, that in the last days, it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. I don't know about you, but I really find it difficult to be a Christian these days. I mean, just to have pure thoughts. It's so hard even inside churches today. It's not easy. I was walking one of the malls that we have in the GTA. Is this part of the GTA? It's already outside GTA. <laughs> there in the GTA. And I was walking inside this mall and I could see in the corner of my eye, I could see here on the, uh, the big wall here, a woman in two piece. <laughs> and I know I was about to pass the uh, store of the uh, Victoria's Secret uh, store. <laughs> And so it's right there in the corner of my eye, this woman is in two pieces. You know, I can almost see the cleavage there already on the side. And then I was tempted to look and just, you know, just have a good look at this, at this uh, wall. And then somebody tapped me on the back, Pastor Roy! Oh no, <laughs> it's good that I did not look. Why, well, it's so embarrassing if, I, if she caught me looking into this. But friends, it's not easy. It's so difficult to be a Christian these days. I mean, the temptations are all around us. And then the Apostle Paul described at least two major concerns in the last days. I mean, if he's talking about the future, friends, we can say, yes, this future has already arrived. Because he talked about, first thing, people will love only themselves and their money. I mean, wow, the, the, the love of money, that's the root of all evil. Money itself is neutral. We need money. I need your money. <laughs> But the love of money, that's the root of all evil. Yeah. And then he said, and will think nothing of immorality. Yes. And again, friends, this is those times when people think nothing of immorality. In many countries today, they have already legalized prostitution, polygamy, incest, that's sex within the family, and bestiality, that's sex with animals. These are the countries in Europe, at least, where incest is allowed, the blue there, that's incest, the, it's allowed, right? There's Spain, Portugal, France, it's all allowed there. For siblings to have sex, for mother with his own son, and for the father with his own daughter. I was just there in Italy, look at oh, uh, pink Italy, it says there, legal if it does not provoke public scandal. I mean, it's okay, as long as nobody complains. It's okay. And so, wow, this, this is crazy. I mean, legal for even for minors in Greece. Right there. Wow. And so here in Germany, it's now considered a fundamental right, incest. And so by law now, they allow siblings to have sex. And the mother and her son, they're getting married in Zimbabwe. And they just abolished uh, uh, adultery in uh, South Africa. 
And of course, for the longest time, the uh, city of Miami was a city of public sex. You can have sex anywhere, even inside the church. Nobody will uh, tell the police or you know, call 911, you know, nobody. And of course, in Germany and EU, to, uh, they're going to legalize pedophilia and with it, child pornography as well. And this is because of their findings. The university academic says that pedophilia is natural and normal for males to be aroused by children. But friends, just because it's natural, just because it's normal, doesn't make it right. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ himself told us this. He said, here in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts. It's already inside the heart. You know, inside you, there's already murder. You may not know it yet, but you're a murderer. I mean, I can create the right situation where you will be, you know, so grim and somebody's going to backstab you or something and then it will make you want to kill this person. It's already there in your heart. And then uh, adultery. You don't know it yet, but you're an adulterer. The situation can come out. Sexual immorality. You may not know it yet, but you're gay. I can create the situation where that desire for the same sex will come out. It's all there. But that's what Jesus Christ is saying. We are all born with it. But friends, just because it's there doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean you have to give in to those desires. And so what is sad is that the American Psychiatric Association, the APA, already reclassified pedophilia as a sexual orientation. So you, you know, who are you to tell me I'm wrong if I want to have sex with children? And then bestiality, having sex with animals, is now becoming more common in Europe. You can go to uh, Denmark, go to a brothel and have sex with animals. In Germany, you can do that. The Canadian government, two years ago, changed the uh, bestiality law. June 9, 2016, the Canadian Supreme Court, in 6 to 1 ruling, allows Canadians to have sexual acts with animals as long as there is no penetration. And so everything is going down the tubes. Immorality. They think nothing of immorality. And then there's this woman, she would like to marry a tree. And she's trying to apply for a marriage license to marry this tree. I don't know. Uh, but uh, if you ask me, I think she's barking at the wrong tree. But, uh, <laughs> but friends, again, this is, they, he, she will be approved because it's under object sexuality. Right now, there are about 30 sexual preferences and one of them is object sexuality to be in love with an object. And that's why it's called LGBTQ plus now. Here in North America, we have 30. In Germany, they have 50 sexual preferences. Five, zero. And so friends, in 28 countries, they already legalized uh, same-sex marriage. The latest, of course, is Taiwan. And Canada is very proud because we are 10 years ahead of America. US is 2015, we are 2005. And, uh, now, because it's out of the box, you know, there's no more definition of uh, what is marriage. It's no longer between a man and a woman now. Why should, we, we, why should we be limited to one partner? Why should we have a couple if, if we can have a throuple? Three people getting married. And so they call this polyamory. Poly means multi, amor means love, multi-love. And so the first uh, lesbian throuple got married in Massachusetts. And then we have the first gay tropel got married in Bangkok, Thailand. And so right there, friends, what we can see here is what the Apostle Paul warned us about. And so here we have marriages are breaking up, families are breaking apart, immorality is breaking out, criminals are breaking in, society is breaking down. And that's why this question the psalmist asks is so important. How can a young person keep his way pure? How do you keep yourself pure during these times? that we are in it's a very important question to answer it raises the fundamental issue of what is what we are really pursuing in life it reflects the very purpose of our existence and again friends praise God he did not leave us in the dark we have in God's word what we are to pursue in life and how we are to accomplish it and so the psalmist declared your word he said is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path the first point i'd like for us to uh, study here is that thy word god's word the bible defines life's real purpose what is life's real purpose 
You see, everything in life hangs on that one word, and that word is purpose. Everything in life hangs on that one word. If there's one question you and I need to answer, it's the question, what is your purpose in life? Why? Because, friends, if you have no purpose, then your life is worthless. When you've lost purpose, life becomes worthless. There's so many people committing suicide because they, they have no more purpose in life. In one of my Bible study groups, is a driver in one of our TTC, the subway, uh, subway trains. And uh, he said, you know, Pastor Roy, we don't really talk about this, but you know, here in Toronto, we average one jumper a week. One jumper a week, that means somebody who jumps into the trucks to commit suicide. I mean, how can that happen in a first-class city like Toronto? In a first-world country like Canada? But you see, when people have lost that, that purpose, life becomes worthless. And that's why it's very important, determine, find out what is your purpose in life. You know, last year, I'm sure the women here would recognize this woman. She committed suicide last year. Who is she? I think you have a bag. <laughs> you know the name? Kate Spade. And she's 55 years old when she committed suicide. I mean, she's a fa fashion icon. I mean, she has reached the ladder of success. And yet, why? Why would that happen? And that same year, of course, uh, Anthony Bourdain also committed suicide. CNN's program, Unknown Parts, or Parts Unknown. And so, friends, that question, what is your purpose in life? Now, what is so sad is that many people today think that because it's enshrined in the U.S. Declaration of Independence that one of our inalienable rights is the pursuit of happiness, a lot of people think that's what life is all about. Life is all about seeking happiness. That's their paradigm. That's their mindset. That's their single intention in life is just to find happiness. And so if you go to Sydney, Australia, you'll find a billboard there that says, Life is short, have an affair. <laughs> Why? Because the pursuit in life is finding happiness. If you're no longer happy with your wife, you know, she's so boring, frigid, monotonous life. I mean, why suffer in that life? Be happy, it's so short, life is so short. And so right now, they come up, you know, every year, the Global Happiness Index. Have you heard of this? The Global Happiness Index. They have about six or eight factors there to uh, see which countries are where, we, where you find the happiest people, supposedly. It's not just the economic uh, factor there, so many factors, there are about eight of them. But last year, 2018, Finland was number one, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland. Canada is number seven right there. 7.3 out of 10. 10 is the highest. We're 7.3 right there. Are you happy? Your name is happy, so you should be happy, yes. And that's why my daughter rejoiced, you know. It's so hard to scold her. Rejoice? I mean, how do you scold? with somebody with that name <laughs> and so if you are looking for the u.s u.s is number 18 jamaica south korea philippines is number 71 out of about 200 countries philippines is number 71 5.5 and so many people today have made it their single-minded focus to find happiness unfortunately to their own destruction because many of the things that we think can make us happy actually are detrimental physically. They are damaging emotionally and they are defiling spiritually. But what the Word of God in fact says, we are not to pursue happiness. Happiness is just a byproduct. Yes. We pursue relationship. There's the horizontal relationship with people and there's the vertical relationship with God. And that's why we read from the writer of Hebrews, he said, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. That means, friends, what you need to pursue is harmony, not happiness. Happiness is just the byproduct to harmony. Be at peace with everyone. And you say, Pastor, how about if, you know, this other person doesn't want peace. I, I desire peace, but he doesn't want peace. Well, the, 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 the Bible also addresses that. 
And so Paul in Romans chapter 12, he said, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with whom? Everyone. With everyone. I mean, that includes your mother-in-law. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's everyone. But it says there, if it is possible, because sometimes it's not possible. <laughs> But as long as it depends on you, you've done everything, you wrote this person, you called this person, you've done everything, and still she doesn't want to be reconciled. I mean, what can you do? But then not only harmony, it says there, make, re make every effort to live in peace with everyone, and then, and to be holy. And that is pursuing holiness. That's the vertical relationship with God. And then the warning it says there, without holiness no one will see the Lord. Without holiness no one will see the Lord. That means it's not just a matter of claiming that I'm born again. I mean it's good if you can recall in your mind you receive the Lord Jesus Christ on that particular date. But more important than that is, do you really see your life growing in holiness? Are you growing closer to God since the time you received Him? Because for some people, conversion is a process. And some people, they receive Christ five times before they finally understood what being born again really is all about. For others, it's an event. The moment they heard it, it's very clear. But friends, what we're seeing here in the Word of God is that God is more interested in our holiness than in our happiness. It's all about relationships, harmony in our relationship with people, and holiness in our relationship with God will produce the right kind of happiness. Thy Word defines life's real purpose. As we've said, everything in life hangs on that one word. That word is purpose. And friends, if you have no purpose, your life is worthless. But the second, the flip side to this, is if you have the wrong purpose, your life is wasted. If you have the wrong purpose, your life is wasted. Again, I find, this, I find it tragic whenever I hear of people, they breach the ladder of success. You know, they climb this ladder of success, they step on people to be able to reach that ladder. They don't have time for their families. They don't have time for their children. They just want to climb this ladder of success. And when they reach the top, it's so lonely up there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The emptiness just comes in. I mean, friends, nobody in his dying moment ever said, I wish I'd spend more time at the office. <laughs> nobody in his dying moment ever said those words. It's always, I wish I had more time for my wife. I wish I had more time for my children. You know, there was this salesman, he's been traveling a lot and he's already old. They're now in a retirement home. And then he found out, you know, his, his wife is there and he hardly knew his wife. And so he said, you know what, I'm going to court my wife all over again. And so she pro he proposed to his wife, proposed to her again. And then they went to sleep and then when he woke up, he said, you know what, I know I proposed to her last night, but I forgot if she said yes or no. <laughs> and so she was very, he was very embarrassed. And so, he, honey, I'm so sorry, but I have to ask you, did you say yes last night or did you say no? <laughs> and the wife said, I know I said yes, but I forgot to ask me. <laughs> Friends, when you already have Alzheimer's, it's too late to be, to be romantic. <laughs> But very interesting, the case of uh, Kate Spade, at the age of 55, she left a suicide note addressed to her 13-year-old daughter, Bea. And in her note, she said, Bea, I have always loved you. This is not your fault. Ask Daddy. So that means the problem was a horizontal relationship. There was a problem there. But you know what, friends? I really believe this. You know, we will experience a lot of heartaches in our horizontal relationships. But if our vertical relationship with God is strong, we can endure it. We can move on. It's very important that vertical relationship with God. I mean, people will disappoint you. They will just disappoint you. And uh, our Anthony Bourdain, when he committed suicide, no suicide note, they just found his body inside the hotel room. But a few weeks before the suicide, he saw a picture of his girlfriend with another man. And so I was reading about this and they were, you know, they were thinking that probably it's because of a horizontal relationship again. But no suicide note. 
But friends, the question here, the list is getting longer here. But the question, is it possible that this pursuit of happiness apart from God is nothing but a cheap anesthetic to dull the pain of an empty life? It's nothing but a cheap anesthetic to dull the pain of an empty life. In fact, there is a misconception in the minds of a lot of people today what really produces happiness. A lot of people think it's happenings should produce the happiness. So many people, I've shared this before, I think, at least last year, uh, a lot of people think that it's the event that produces the emotion. And so happenings will produce the happiness. Now, this is a misconception because if this is true, that means to change the emotion, you need to change the event. And so if you ask somebody, why are you sad? And then he says, my girlfriend broke up with me. And so to make him happy, then that means you have to reverse that event. They need to uh, go back. But friends, this is not true. It's not the event that changes the emotion, that dictates the emotion. Because again, you know, it's a lot simpler if it's just like this. But the problem is, if it's the event that dictates the emotion, if you want to change the emotion, you need to change the event. So if my wife is causing me to be depressed, to change the depression, I need to change my wife. You know, that's, that's how people are solving their problems today. That's how people are solving problems. Try to think about it. That's how they solve their problems today. Just change the event. You know, change your location, change your job, change your wardrobe, change your face. You know, for Filipinos, we need to have a nose lip because our noses are flat. You know, we need to copy the cheekbones of Cameron Diaz. And then we need to copy the pouting lips of Angelina Jolie. And then we need to copy the cleft chin of John Travolta. You know, you keep changing things because changing the event will change the emotion. Now, friends, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that there are no legitimate reasons for changing jobs, for changing your location. But I can assure you this. There are people who are bored, tired in the Philippines. They migrated to Canada and they're still bored, tired today. <laughs> It's still the same. It's not just a matter of changing events. It's not the event that can change or produces the emotion. Because if that is true, why is it that two people can have exactly the same event and yet two different emotions? For example, Peter won. His wife died and he was depressed. Another husband, his name is also Peter. Let's just call him Peter too. His wife also died. But he was delighted. <laughs> I thought it's the event that produces the emotion. So how is it that two people can have exactly the same event and yet two different emotions? Because friends, it's not the event that produces the emotion, it's the evaluation of the event. That's what produces the emotion. You see, Peter too was having an affair. And now that his wife has died, he can legitimize the affair. He was delighted. I mean, he shed some tears, of course. But deep inside, oh, wow, I can legitimize my affair now. You see, friends, it's the evaluation of the event that needs to change. And that's why the Bible is replete with commands and exhortations to change the way we evaluate. Yeah. And that's why James could write these words. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Look at this. There's the joy. That's the emotion. Look at trials. That's the event. These two things don't usually go together. But, Paul, but James here said, you can be joyful even in the midst of trials. How is that possible? Because verse 3, he said, because you know, that's the evaluation. You know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And that's why we need to change our perspective in life. That's why we need to read God's word. Because God's word changes the way we think. Yeah. And the Apostle Paul, that's what you call a paradigm shift. And here the Apostle Paul said, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God's word renews our mind. Again, that's the paradigm shift that needs to happen. In another letter, Paul said, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. That means even though these are earthly things, but you have a spiritual intention for it. When I bought my car, I said, you know what? 
I'll buy this seven-seated car because, you know, I can take more people in, bring them to the Bible study, you know, bring these people to the church. I can have more people who can sit there in that car. You know, it's a material thing, but you have a spiritual intention for it. When you buy your house, when you, anything. Yeah. Don't just set your things on earthly things. Set your minds on what is above. Yeah. And so friends, that's what you call a paradigm shift. And again, in one more letter, he said, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And these things can only be found in the Word of God. That's the paradigm shift. And that's why here the psalmist can change the way he views things. He said here in... Uh, Verse 14, he said, I have rejoiced in your loss as much as in riches. Really? How can you rejoice in God's loss? I mean, God's loss are kill joy. <laughs> but because there's a paradigm shift now, he can rejoice as much as in riches. It just changes the way you view things. And so friends, thy word, number one, defines life's real purpose it defines life's real purpose now to answer the question in verse 9 the psalmist declared the answer to this how can a young man keep his way pure he answered in verse 11 by living according to your word brothers and sisters if there ever was a day and hour when we needed to hear god's word this is the day and this is the hour yet there are people today who say that the bible is a relic of the past the Bible is antiquated. The Bible is out of date. The Bible is out of touch. You can base your morality on, on things that were written 2,000 years ago. And so what we have today is morality by majority. What the majority says becomes right. We become the definer of what is right and what is wrong. And that's basically the Garden of Eden. That was the temptation that Satan gave Eve. You don't have to wait on God. Did God really say? You don't have to wait on Him to tell you what is right. You can become God. You can know what is right and what is wrong. You can now make the decision. You don't have to wait on God. But friends, the problem with this is what Solomon warned us. He said, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. We cannot decide what is right and what is wrong just on our preferences. In some cultures, you cannot eat your neighbor. In other cultures, you can eat your neighbor. <laughs> I mean, what's your preference? <laughs> what is right and what is wrong there? I mean, friends, you can do it your way if you're just singing a song. You can do it your own style. You can sing like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. It's okay. If you're just singing a song, if you're just eating your burger, you can eat at Burger King, you can have it your way. <laughs> no onions, please. All right, have it your way. I mean, friends, it's okay. You can have it your way, you know, eating burger, singing a song. But when it comes to life, when it comes to right and wrong, you cannot do it your way. Right. And that's what Solomon exactly did. said. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. So how many people today, how are people today determining what is right and what is wrong? At least four ways now. Number one is what we call subjectivism. If it feels good, it must be right. If it feels good, it must be right. That becomes the basis of what is right and wrong. And so this young people, young uh, woman approached her pastor and said, Pastor, you know what? This man, he is my soulmate, Pastor. Pastor, this man is my world. I really feel so loved by this man. Lord, pastor, you know, my life is incomplete without this man. And the pastor said, really? That's how much you love this man? Yes, pastor, I love him so much. What should we do with his wife? You see, he's married. But pastor, he said he's going to divorce his wife and marry me. You see, that's the problem. If you just base it on love, you can... You know, a lot of negative things, rotten things can happen. Love is not the basis of right and wrong. God's design is the basis of right and wrong. Another one they use is rationalism. If it makes sense, then it must be right. If it makes sense, you know, pastor, it makes sense. I'm 16 years old, pastor, 
and I'm pregnant. I cannot carry this baby. I'm, I'm a baby myself, Pastor. I need to abort this baby. It makes sense. I mean, I'm 16 years old, Pastor. Can you imagine this? I cannot take care of this baby. I mean, that's rationalism. It makes sense, isn't it? I mean, when you're paying your income tax and you're having a hard time with your finances, why not just remove one zero? <laughs> I mean, removing one zero will save you lots of money. I mean, it will not bankrupt Canada. Come on, Canada is so rich. <laughs> it's okay. It makes sense. Again, rationalism. You rationalize things. Oh, pastor, I mean, he's not a Christian. But you know what? He's better than the Christians inside this church. <laughs> I mean, it's okay, Pastor. I mean, you know, you can rationalize a lot of things. And then the third way is pragmatism. It, if it works, then it must be right. If it works. I mean, if you're a salesman, you don't talk about right or wrong. Just make your quota. As long as you make your quota, that makes it right. That's pragmatism. But of course, these first three, they're now garbage. Because right now in our society, it's what you call postmodernism. In postmodernism, nothing is absolute. There is no such thing as truth. Nothing is absolute. And that's why you always hear opera. Your truth and my truth and your truth. You know, your truth works for you. It doesn't work for me. Your truth is your truth. It's not my truth. You know, nothing is absolute. That's the opera kind of morality. And that's why Christianity will never work in a postmodernist society. Because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. That's absolute. Yes. It will not work in a postmodernist society. And as we go from day to weeks and months and years, the polarization will become so clear that it will become illegal to be a Christian. There's going to be a legislation in our in our, um, what do you call the, the legislature here in Canada? The parliament, yes. That it will be legal for us pastors to preach against homosexuality, to preach against these things. I mean, friends, again, please don't misunderstand me here. Remember what Jesus Christ said, all of these are in the heart already. We're not better than them because they have these desires. We also have these desires. It's not just not coming out yet. We have different things, you know. We have different addictions. They have different addictions. That, that we, we're not better than them. We're on the same boat. We all need the mercy of God. Yeah. The only reason you're here is because of the grace of God. Yeah. Don't look down at these people. That's right. They're struggling too. What they need is to be understood what they're going through. They need love, not condemnation. Yeah. And so when we talk like this, it's not hate language. It's actually loving them. Because we don't allow them to follow the, continue in that path where we know that God's word says it leads to death. And so friends, the question the psalmist asks, how can a young person keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Praise God, the absolute word of God. And then number two, what we see here, thy word determines life's right priorities. It determines life's right priorities. In 106, the psalmist said here, he said, I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. Again, as we've said, everything in life hangs on that one word and that word is purpose. Because friends, your purpose determines your priorities. Whatever your purpose is, that is what determines your priorities. And so here for the psalmist, he said, what is his priority? I will keep your righteous ordinances. That becomes his priority. In other portions, he said here in verse 10, with my whole heart, I have sought you. And then in verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart. You know, if your purpose is to know God, then Bible study becomes important. It becomes a priority. Prayer meeting becomes a priority. If you want to be drawn closer to God. And so whatever your purpose is, that determines your priority. And then here in verse 15, I will study your commandments. And then here in verse 16, I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And so friends, I'm going to show you here what your priorities are just as you're seated there. What you want most. 
That exposes your priority, your purpose. What you think about most will reveal what your purpose is. And then how you use your money reveals what your purpose is in life. And then what you do with your leisure time that can determine what your priority is and what really is your purpose in life. And then the company you enjoy. That can reveal the purpose in your life. What your priority is. Number six, who and what you admire. And then number seven, what you laughed at. That can determine what your purpose is. I mean, some things are not necessarily wrong. They are just not necessary. <laughs> If what you're doing is not aligned with your purpose, then friends, that's not your, not your priority. I mean, you cannot attend all the party invitations because some of those parties, they go against, they are detrimental to your purpose. That's true. And that's why I love this statement by Rabbi Zacharias. He said, any pleasure that refreshes you without diminishing you, distracting you, or sidetracking you from the ultimate goal is a legitimate pleasure. Now, what is he saying here? What he's saying here is whatever it is that you get involved yourself in, these things, the websites you visit, the people you associate with, the places you go to, the movies you watch, the books you read, whatever you get involved yourself in, they should not diminish, they should not distract, they should not sidetrack you from your ultimate goal, from your purpose in life. Yeah. Let's break this down for the students. I think there's still some students here. I mean, for a student, what's your goal? What's your ultimate goal as a student? You want to graduate. That's it. You want to graduate. That's your purpose in life. You want to graduate. I mean, if you're a biblical student, you know you're a 910 student. You know a 910 student? 910 is Ecclesiastes 910. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. That means you want to graduate with honors. Don't just graduate 75. You know, you want to graduate 95. You know, that's your goal as a Christian student. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Now, here's the question now. Will spending so much time on computer games, will that diminish you, distract you, or sidetrack you from your ultimate goal to graduate? Now, friends, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying playing computer games is wrong. I'm not saying it's sinful. But you need to know yourself. Can you be enslaved by these things? Is spending so much time on Facebook, will that diminish you, distract you, or sidetrack you? And then, is having a boyfriend or a girlfriend, will that distract you from graduating? Now, we're not saying it's wrong to have a girlfriend, it's wrong to have a boyfriend. We're not saying that. Because some people, because they have a girlfriend, it inspires them to graduate. That's true. <laughs> But for others, because of a boyfriend, it distracts them. It impedes them. They did not graduate, they receive an MD. MD means marriage degree. <laughs> so, again, they did not graduate. And so, friends, you need to know yourself. That's what it means. Know your purpose because your purpose will determine your priorities. And then lastly, friends, and we're done here, it discovers life's remarkable potential. God's word will reveal to you what changes can happen in your life, what power you possess. That's right. Now that you're a child of God. Yes. The psalmist in that last verse, it, said, it says here in 107, I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. God's word can revive us. Friends, a true encounter with God's word can be life-changing. Yeah. It can truly change the way you think, the way you evaluate your situation. In fact, there are four benefits according to Psalm, 100, Psalm 19, verses 7 to 8. He said, The law of the Lord is perfect. One, it restores the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. What? Number two, it makes wise the simple. The presence of the Lord are right. It rejoices the heart. I'm sorry. I went ahead. And then the commandments of the Lord is pure. It enlightens the eyes. Friends, it gives you a paradigm shift. It changes your perspective in life, the way you evaluate your situation. Therefore, you can choose to do what is right. You cannot believe what is available to you unless you know it from the Word of God. 
And that's why, friends, that question again, how can a young person keep his way pure? Is it really possible to live a pure life in this time and age? Brothers and sisters, let's read this together, and we're almost done. Ready, read. We will never know our true potential unless we know our real identity. You got to know your real identity, who you are before God. And then, that's when you will know your true potential. I just came from Rome, and then I was reading this verse. The Apostle Paul wrote these words, he said, to all in Rome. But you know what? This letter is not only for the Christians who were living in Rome at that time. It's also for us today. I forgot to change the name here. But let's just say it's Gulp. I used it this morning, which is London. All right? That's London right there. I was in a hurry, so I did not change that. But that should be Gulp. All right? To all in Gulp. If you think you're not part of this, again, this is CLCG. That should be G. CLC Gulp. And so CLC Gulp, those of you who are here this afternoon, here's how God views us. Number one, you are what? You are loved by God. You are loved by God. You know, a lot of times when, we, when things doesn't happen the way we want them to happen, we feel like God doesn't love us, isn't it? Why is it, Lord, I still don't have a boyfriend? I'm already 31 years old, Lord. I still don't have a boyfriend. And you know, a lot of things. Uh, you don't get the job. You don't get your papers to stay here in Canada. You have to go back to the Philippines. And you feel like God doesn't love you. But friends, never, never, never entertain that thought because God loves you. Yeah. He loves you so much, He sent His own Son yeah. to die for you. Yeah. That's how much God loves loves you you don't see the end yet but God knows the end he has a better plan why these things are not happening but God loves you come on say to the one beside you God loves you just say to the one seated beside God loves you God loves you never doubt God's love but not only that we are also called to be what we are called to be saints wow the one see you're seated beside with is a saint. Come on, tell the one you are a saint. You are a saint. I mean, doesn't that give you goosebumps to imagine that your husband is a saint? But saint pala tong husband ko. I cannot believe that my husband is a saint. And yet that's the truth. God's word says you are a saint. Because the word saint simply means set apart. That's right. You are a saint. You are being set apart. You know how vehicles in, in the Philippines are known, are, are, you know, that they, they are government-owned? It's because on the side, they print the words, for government use only. You know it's a government-owned. You see, that car is a saint. It's been set apart for, God, for government use only. Yeah. The moment you become born again, God puts a mark on you. And God says, for God's use only. Come on. You are a saint. That's why you are a saint. Friends, it will change the way you go to work tomorrow, knowing that you're a saint. I'm a saint of God, you know. I'm going to work tomorrow. It changes the way you treat your wife. It changes the way you treat your children. It changes the way you drive on 401. Because, you know, some saints, they drive like demons on 401. But, friends, remember, you are a saint. I love this. Swindoll, he said, we cannot rise above our present predicament unless we know our real identity and realize our true potential. Again, friends, I don't have so many illustrations to illustrate this, but I love this one. I know I've used it before, but never mind. I know there's some more new here. There was this American Indian. He found an, eag an eagle's egg there in the eagle's nest. He scooped this egg from the eagle's nest and then placed it on the nest of prairie chicken. And so this eagle's egg hatched. And then he looked at his mom. His mom is a prairie chicken. He looked at his dad. His dad is a prairie chicken. And so he grew up believing that he's a prairie chicken. And so he would eat the same way prairie chickens would eat, just scratch on the ground for some seeds or worms. When he flew, it's just a few thrashing of wings, just a few feet above the ground. The same way prairie chickens would fly. But then one day as an adult, he saw this magnificent bird just, fl just flying over there in that cloudless sky, the majesty, he looked at it, oh wow, what a beautiful bird, what is it? <laughs> and then his prairie chicken neighbor said, that's an eagle, the chief of the birds, and then warned him, but don't give it a second thought, you could never be like him. 
and he never gave it a second thought. And this eagle died believing that he's a prairie chicken. That's tragic, isn't it? He didn't realize his true potential because he didn't know his real identity. But friends, I can tell you something more tragic than an eagle dying thinking that it's a prairie chicken. What more tragic than that is a Christian, a person who has been born again, he's been washed in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, and yet he's living a defeated life, burdened by guilt, distorted by bad habits, ravaged by bad conscience, hardened by self-indulgence, disfigured by sin. Nothing can be more tragic than that. God did not save you so that you can continue wallowing in the mud. That's not who we are. God created us so that we can soar to the sky. Know your identity because then you will know your true potential. The, the, the things that you can do, that you'll be able to say no to drugs, you can say no to illicit sex. You know, when your boyfriend tells you, you know what, it's my birthday next week, I'm going to reserve a room in this hotel. You can tell your boyfriend because you know who you are. Don't you know that I'm the child of the King of Kings? I'm the daughter of the Lord of Lords. This body has been paid for with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Go back to your mama and have your diapers changed. Because that's the most selfish, that's the most childish things you can ask of me. If you know your real identity, you know how to decide how to encounter situations in life. In fact, friends, let me just close now with a true story. Let me ask the worship team to join me here now. Again, this is a true story. During those times before the internet, this husband and wife and their two young kids, the husband is in the military and he was assigned to go to Japan. And so he talked to his wife and his two young boys, promised them that he's going to write them every week. This is before the internet. And so he flew to Japan. Every week he would write to his wife and his two young boys. And these two young boys are so anticipating of these letters coming from their dad. But then a few months later, the letter became every other week. And then it became monthly. And then every other month. And then a few years down the road, the letter came. And this husband said to his wife, No matter how I write this letter, you will be broken hearted before the end of the letter. But I will not be going back home. I've fallen in love with another woman here and our romance is building very strongly and we will be getting married and please tell the children that I will not be coming home. She was so shocked. She cannot believe her eyes. For days she could not talk and the kids have been asking, Mom, where's the letter from Dad? But one day she was able to muster enough courage and tell her older boy, I'm sorry, but your dad will no longer be coming back home. He fell in love with another woman there in Japan. And you know, these boys, they do not know what it, what it means exactly. And so this elder son asked the mom, Mommy, can I ask you something? Just because daddy doesn't love us anymore, does it mean we're not allowed to love him anymore? And the wife didn't know how to answer that. I mean, he knew the answer to this question, but what? And then finally she said, no, we are still allowed to love your dad. And the boy said, okay, mom, just write to dad. Tell him we want to still love him even if he doesn't love us anymore. Just tell him to continue writing to us. And that's what she did. And then finally this letter came. The husband said, I'm sorry to be writing this way to you, but I have found out, I just found out I have cancer and I'm not going to live very long. I do not have much money to support my family here because I have forfeited my pension back there. Would you consider it possible every month to save up some money after I die and send it to my family here to help them? Ang kapal! How callous this man can be! Again, she cannot believe her eyes. The, the anger is just growing deep inside her. 
But then she remembered the words of her son. And the son, those words, just because daddy doesn't love us anymore, does it mean we are not allowed to love him anymore? And then she wrote her husband and she said, you know, we're struggling here too. We don't have that money to send to your family there. But here's what we're going to do. Send your family here to America and they can stay with us. We can teach them the language. We will help them to be self-supporting. And once they can do that, they will separate on their own. And that's exactly how it happened. Before the husband died, sent his family to America, lived with his original family, taught them the language, helped them to be self-supporting. And the end of the article, this woman is a Christian. Here's what she said. She said, I can either look back upon my life and curse that man every moment for what he had done to me with sheer anger and find myself molested twice over. Or I can thank God for giving me the privilege of shining his light in a very dark tunnel in this world. Brothers and sisters, you have the power to choose to do what is right. Once you know who you are, you are a child of God, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, you can love the unlovable, you can forgive the unforgivable, you can touch the untouchable. You have been given that power to overcome wrong with right. Friends, I do not know what you're going through these days. I do not know what decisions you have to make these days. But we have the power to choose to do what is right. I'd like for us to just stand right now. Let's just sing with the...